Welcome to the continuation of our presentation of and the introductory to the Centering Prayer practice. Most of you have already heard the four preliminary talks on prayer as relationship, the method of centering prayer, and uh, its difficulties in regard to the thoughts that occur during the time of prayer, and finally its effects in daily life. The question now arises, where does this prayer come from? Uh, where is it rooted in the scripture? And there is a wonderful uh, text uh, that Jesus offers us as a recommendation of how to pray in Matthew 6, 6, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And there we see uh, the following suggestion. When you pray, says Jesus, Enter into your private room. Close the door and there pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now this prayer is, is obviously uh, designed to uh, introduce us to a new uh, relationship with God. In Jesus' time, the word God was never said out of respect for Yahweh, as, as he was known in the Hebrew religion. And so if you said this word even by accident, you were in trouble. There's even a text in the Qumran Dead Sea Scrolls that, where one of the members of the community said the name of God, Yahweh, by accident. And, and he was excommunicated, thrown out of the community. So the, there was this deep sense of reverence for the very name of Yahweh that prevented anyone from writing it or saying it. And so now here Jesus comes along and says the word. Only he not only says a word for God, Abba, but he says a word that is, is, is intensely intimate, personal, uh, loving, parental, I suppose you would say. It really means something equivalent in our language to, to daddy or papa or the old man or whatever is the popular name for father in, in your particular culture. And so what Jesus has really done is to take the socially accepted way, uh, customary procedure of referring to God and turning it right upside down in order to give us a totally new concept or idea for this sacred, tremendous mystery that no one even dared to speak about. So, so right away when Jesus says, when you want to pray, enter into your private room, close the door, and pray to your father, to your Abba, to your Papa. This suggests right away an incredible intimacy that already exists between you and Abba and this private room which is a way of accessing the presence of the ultimate mystery as intimate, close, tender, and affectionate. So right away, the relationship of prayer from becoming awesome or terrifying or full of dread so that you'd be afraid to part your hair or, or, or have your clothes on, uh, uh, twisted, or, or the slightest misstep is gone. We're now in a situation, a, a relationship that is relaxed and intimate. And so entering the private room then uh, and closing the door and praying in secret uh, suggests three particular steps in the process. The first one is to let go of all our ordinary occupation 
our immediate environment and the people who were in it. And, and metaphorically, then, it means moving into the inner part of our uh, psyche, uh, beyond our ordinary psychological awareness and preoccupations. Moving, in other words, into the spiritual level of our being. So the private room might be translated our inner room, that is, the inner space beyond our ordinary psychological faculties, where Jesus suggests the Father, the Abba, is waiting for us and is, is present, but hidden and is secret. And so the way to find the hidden God, as Isaiah specifically calls him, is to get into a secret place too. And that secret place within us is the spiritual level of our being where our intuitive faculties are at work, our passive intellect, and our will uh, towards God. So uh, we decided to pray then. We go into our interior place and notice the details. We close the door so that we not only leave outside our external occupations and environment, but we leave outside our, what might be called our interior dialogue, that is, our, our, our thoughts and perceptions, the, 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 the kind of conversation with ourselves that goes on a lot of the time, that says, well, uh, what will I tell this person? How will I get even? What's the, just the right word to speak to my boss? or to my children, or to my wife or husband, or, or to the President of the United States, if you prefer. In other words, all that endless conversation with ourselves that might be called the interior dialogue, that is, is, is left outside when we close the door. We close the door, in other words, or lower the curtains on all our usual psychological uh, imagery, preoccupation, rationalizations, justifications. So, so the, this private room then gets to be more and more secret. And finally, the most fully secret place is when we stop thinking about ourselves. In other words, how am I doing in this prayer? Well, where is this Abba that invited me into this private room? Uh, what am I going to do for lunch? In other words, all forms of self-reflection are left outside too as we close the door, and as some translation has it, bolt the door. So wh whenever you return then to your ordinary thoughts or preoccupations or the interior dialogue, it's as if you are getting up, opening the door, and going outside again. So that means you just have to repeat the process go back in the private room, your inner room, close the door again, let go of the thoughts, and, and pray to your Abba, to this intimate mis but mysterious presence, this hidden presence, this secret presence. Pray in secret from everything outside, everything inside, and from all self reflection. This then is, is the suggestion that Jesus has as to how to proceed in your private prayer. You might raise this question, how do I know what to pray for in this place? If, if by closing the door, I'm supposed to pray without words, without opening my mouth, knowing that the Father, the Abba, listens to our hearts rather than our words. There's another a wonderful saying of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in which he suggests what to pray for in this depth of relating 
to the Abba in our inmost being. It's, it suggests, above all, uh, praying with the, the inner freedom of not having to follow our thoughts and preoccupations or noticing the external sounds that might be in the room where we're praying. There is a sense in which solitude and silence is a great help in fostering this movement into interior silence. But once it's established, since the interior silence is within us, we can bring it with us into any activity so that eventually in places of noise and activity and even in activities that involve our thinking processes and minds, which is the duties of our state of life often require, we find ourselves still in the same silence. So the private room is always accessible because it's within us, and the content of the private room as a place of meeting with Abba is always there. So that the, the presence of God through this prayer becomes more and more habitual and capable of accompanying us, not only in prayer, but in everyday life. And, uh, and in, in this way, our activity comes from the center, that is, from the influence, from the uh, love and affection and presence of this tender Father, Abba, that we are beginning to know by the regular practice of centering prayer. How do we know that what to pray for? Jesus, as I was just uh, referring to, has this further saying in which he uh, gives us this example. What, what parent, if your child asks you for a piece of bread, would give the child a stone? Immediately you say, I wouldn't, if you're a parent. And then he says it again in another image. Which one of you, if your child should ask you for a fish, would you give them a, a snake? And, and finally, a third time, he says, uh, which child, if, if, they, if it asked you for an egg, would you give it an, a poisonous asp? Well, well, in the culture, bread was a little bit like a stone. It was flat, like pita bread today. And in the Sea of Galilee, there were fish who looked like eels. So, so it was a very practical example in which a, uh, I suppose, some malicious parent could say, well, here, Sonny, uh, you, you ask for a piece of bread, uh, try this, and you hand them a stone. Or <laughs> ask for the, for the fish, and oh, well, see if you like this nice poisonous snake. So, so Jesus says, if you folks, with your limitations, actually, Jesus puts it a little stronger, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Abba, the Father, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit is the supreme gift of the Father and the Son. It's, it's the person of love in the Trinity. It's the person who is the quintessence, you might say, of the spirituality of the Trinity, which is unconditional love, totally pouring out itself, one relationship to the other, infinitely self-giving, non-possessive, seeking no reward, simply sheer goodness, diffusive of itself, of its very nature. This is the gift, then, that we are asking for when we enter the private room, close the door on our thoughts, and pray not with words, but with our intention to consent, simply consent, to God's presence and action 
within us. So you don't have to ask for anything else in this prayer. If you receive the divine spirit, the supreme gift of father and son, everything else comes with you. Hence, the time of centering prayer is not the time to pray specifically for others, because the very fact that you're there is a prayer for everything that God wants you to pray for, for everything that he could possibly give you. And hence, you can relax. Just to be with God is to be with everyone else and with everyone else's needs, because that's where the Abba is and where his concerns also are. You might also ask the question, how do we know that we are called to contemplative prayer? Baptism is itself an invitation to contemplative prayer. In virtue of being baptized or the desire for baptism, perhaps even the desire for silence and solitude before we have come to any form of, of a particular faith in God. All of these signs are guilt invitations to enter into the divine life, which is really what contemplation is. Contemplative prayer is an ongoing process of relating to God beyond our ordinary faculties into ever deeper intimacy that brings us not just into contact with divine life, but into the experience, into the flow, into the stream of charity that flows out forever from God and gathers us back into that stream if only we will venture out into the stream. The stream itself will carry us back into the, into the bosom of God. Remember, Jesus invites us to follow me. And that, that invitation, follow me, really means follow me to Jerusalem, to the sacrifice of the cross, to death, and then into the bosom of the Father. And all of these various stages of our following of Christ begin in this life and are anticipated here. Both the suffering that belongs to sharing in Christ's passion and the joy and the glory in experiencing the presence of God, which is an anticipation of our resurrection by way of an inner resurrection. So centering prayer, then, is really a practical way of implementing Jesus' recommendation in at wisdom saying about how to pray. It contains a, a, a method of following or, or making practical a way of assimilating ourselves step by step to this process of movement into our private room, into the capacity to close the door, not on the world, not on other people's needs, but on our attachments to the world, which is what worldliness really is, and, and the capacity to be with Christ and with God in the interior silence that sensitizes us to the mystery of God's presence. St. John of the Cross has, has this saying, the Father spoke one word from all eternity, and he speaks it in an eternal silence, and it is in silence that we hear it. Notice the invitation to listen at ever-deepening levels of sensitivity to the movement and presence of the Spirit and of the Abba 
dwelling within us. And, and this process reminds us of, of that, that the primary principle on which the spiritual journey is based in any tradition is the presence of the ultimate reality, whom we call the most holy trinity in the Christian tradition, within us. There's no place to go, then, to find God, because he's already here. It's a question of our awakening, little by little, to that presence by letting go of the obstacles to our hearing the word of God addressed to us through scripture from the outside and welling up from inside as a result of, of the word of God in scripture and in the sacraments and, and entering into ever deeper participation in that presence. Really, the presence of God at ever deepening levels and pervading more and more of our faculties, even down to the cells of our bodies, is what Christian transformation is all about. Hence, entering the private room is simply Jesus' suggestion how you can proceed. And centering prayer is simply an interpretation of Jesus' remarks as to how to proceed. It's a how-to method that's appropriate for people of our time who expect to be told how to do anything, you know, how to cook an egg, how to change a tire, <laughs> how to turn on the computer, uh, how to take medicine. Everything has directions nowadays, how to. And so centering prayer is only one effort, and there's several others in our time, in, in which we, we suggest a how-to method to, to express and to move into the kind of prayer that has been traditional from the beginning of the Christian era and has gone by different names. For instance, the prayer of faith. You could call centering prayer that. The only difference is the method that we've adapted to this process. The, the text that we've been looking at about the private room is really an umbrella term, you might say, or, or paradigm in which every, every method that has been conceived of in the Christian tradition uh, emerges from or is included in and, and has been expressed appropriately in different centuries or eras, times, or environments. And so centering prayer is simply one carefully adapted way of expressing that, that prayer. You also find it in the Christian tradition under other terms, the prayer of simple regard, which emphasizes the fact that one is always uh, under this loving gaze of God that enfolds us with his compassionate presence. And, and uh, another word from the tradition is the prayer of simplicity, which suggests reducing all our thoughts and particular acts of the will which is all involved in praying in secret. Centering prayer is perhaps the most receptive method because it goes beyond any effort on our part except to maintain our intention to be in the presence of God and open to his loving action within us. Notice we consent to God's presence and action. We're not just present, <laughs> accepting a static presence or venerated presence, but a dynamic presence that addresses us not in words, but in the extraordinary language of God, which is silence. God's first language is silence. Everything else is a bad translation. And so to hear the word of God at the deepest level is to hear it at the deepest level of silence, where the heart 
is completely open to God and the mind is not attentive to any particular content but simply to the general loving presence in faith that in this inner room at the spiritual level of our being which we're cultivating in centering prayer the divine presence is always available always not exactly speaking to us because that makes us think of words and ideas but is nudging us you might say and and through the senses through all our other faculties, through the beauty of nature, through the goodness of other people, even through their badness, somewhere at the bottom of all suffering and evil is the presence of God, which the eye of faith cultivated in this inner room is able to penetrate so that God, little by little, becomes part of everyday life a kind of fourth dimension to the three-dimensional world in which we live and, and is suggesting through the gifts of the Spirit that we receive in baptism and are strengthened by confirmation and by every time we receive the Eucharist and by every time we enter the private room to enhance this meeting or this relationship. And, and finally, let's conclude with this, this realization of how close God is to us and how tender is this closeness to us. It's, it's like a couple who have lived together and loved each other and shared the sorrows and griefs of family life and difficulties with the children and maybe a couple of bankruptcies and diseases and all that, who, who know each other so well and who love each other so much that they can move beyond words and just sit together presenting to each other their simple presence as a gift. And they can spend hours doing that or they could share some simple experience like watching a sunset or, or listening to music. And, and when they get a little bit distracted, they just hold hands or look into one or another's eyes as if to say, I'm still here. But it's, it's, it's this movement from conversation to communion that takes place in the inner room. It does not destroy the other ways of relating. It simply enhances them and adds a further dimension to the relationship which is the experience of the total gift that love can give of oneself in silence just by being together.